<laughs> okay. If you didn't know, uh, we are in a study of the book of Jeremiah. Now, what's what's what I need to tell you? Hey, Amy. Um, is this is not going to be a study really about the book of Jeremiah as such. And what I mean by that is it's 52 chapters. Uh, a quarter is not enough time to cover that amount of material. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to choose to hit on the high, what I consider the high points of Jeremiah. We're going to learn about uh, Jeremiah personally, what it's like to be a prophet, uh, what, what that entails and what that life was like, at least for Jeremiah. We're going to learn about why Israel was in such trouble and why they needed prophets to speak to them and why God in his grace and goodness sent prophets to them. And we're going to learn a lot as I prayed in my prayer about the heart of God. Because we're going to see, you know, what he loves, what he hates, uh, how he reacts to circumstances, how he reacts to people's <clears throat> decisions uh, in life. And so uh, I hope that it will be very beneficial in that regard. And tonight we're going to we're going to be uh, the name of the lesson is a prophet for today. So um, let's jump in. Here's just a little bit of very little bit of background uh, about the, the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied roughly 2,500 years ago. So we're talking about um, somewhere between 500 and, and 700 BC. Okay. The prophet, the prophetic book that bears his name was written down by Jeremiah and his secretary Baruch, uh, and his secretary Baruch, but is not recorded in chronological order. That's why we, as you go along and you're reading the book of Jeremiah, you will say, that makes more sense that that would have happened earlier. And the fact of the matter is it may have, but he was recording uh, events and, and when it was compiled, apparently it was not compiled in, um, in chronological order, okay? Um, Jeremiah was a contemporary of the prophets Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Ezekiel, and Daniel, as God gave one last ditch effort to reach Israel before their destruction. Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years during five different Judean, uh, Judean kingships. Which of these contextual facts is most interesting to you and why? As you look at that little brief overview, uh, what of those things is most interesting to you and why? None of them, huh? That's, uh, that's unfortunate. What do, you, what do you find interesting about that? Well, for me, <clears throat> one, <clears throat> one last-ditch effort to reach Israel before their destruction. You know, my son just returned from Israel this morning, 15-hour mm -hmm. trip. Mm -hmm. um, he talked about Israel and all the places he went and how commercialized it is now. <laughs> yes. And all of the strange and weird things that he saw, not the, the biblical places that he went, but the, the environment. Yeah. Uh, he said, you know, this is the Holy Land, but it just seems like to the people who live there, many of them don't regard it as such. And that kind of made me 
you know, you're in the, the most holy place in the world and you're, you're, you're selling beads and things, you know, that, you know, I guess you got to do what you got to do to survive. And tourism is a huge mm -hmm. uh, industry in Israel, but that's what jumped out to me. Okay. Uh, he is correct. There is a lot of commercialization and people exploiting I think that's not an unfair word, exploiting the, the circumstances to, to, to make a dollar. Um, it, it is a currently a mixture, quite a mixture of Muslims, Christians, and Jews, um, Jerusalem in particular. So uh, Jerusalem is uh, a lot different than it was 2,500 years ago. So what do you find interesting of the, those facts about book it lasted 40 years talk about that what do you what do you mean well prophets for your life was not easy and to be faithful to god and last that long for that many kings it's pretty amazing yeah it, it's I, I appreciate you saying that because that is exactly jerry what i um, put down I, I said i'm a little surprised he survived the hostilities of kings in ordinary people for that many years. <clears throat> there were attempts to kill him, but somehow God worked providentially to protect him from the many um, efforts to put Jeremiah to death. Now, we'll get into this more deeply as we go through, but why might people want to put Jeremiah to death? He's a prophet of God. In God, among God's chosen people in the Holy Land. Why in the world would they want to put Jeremiah to death? Because he reminds them of the way to be or the way that they should be. So he, he probably brings out feelings of shame and other things. I, don't know. I think you're in the right, we're on the right track. Why would, why would people want to? Kill Jeremiah, Mark. Because uh, he didn't put it in order. Because he didn't put the, <laughs> put, the, put the book in order? I should have known when you had this little grin. The rest of you couldn't see it, but Mark had this little grin like, I'm going to say something that's going to crack everybody up. Uh, wrong answer. <laughs> A lot of false gods back then. Maybe he wasn't saying what they wanted to hear why why does anybody become unpopular well it wasn't very well done i'm sorry i mean it it could have mattered i mean seriously though i mean despite you know the the you know humorous undertones i mean that's a serious dude yeah yeah Correct. again move, moving on to what mike said um why does anybody become unpopular? Hard work, as you guys, elders do. They're saying things you don't want to hear. They're saying things you don't want to hear. And Jeremiah said a lot of that. Um, but he was always speaking from what God had directed him to say. It wasn't as though uh, Jeremiah was some kind of renegade. Um, and so, You've heard the, the phrase, uh, don't shoot the messenger. Uh, this didn't apply to Jeremiah, apparently. They were ready to shoot the messenger. When you don't like the message, the natural human reaction is shut up the messenger. And that's what they tried to do. So I'm surprised that Jeremiah lasted as long as he did with so much animosity directed toward him. Anybody else? What what of those facts stand out to you? Now, Jeremiah is in Jerusalem. Is he, um, Daniel, you know, he was he was in Babylon. And so God was God was speaking through prophets in both Israel and Babylon, trying to help the people come to their senses before it was too late. But as we're going to see, um, the die was kind of cast at this point. 
So question number two, let's read 2 Kings 23, 1 through 7, and then verses 25 through 27. Somebody read those verses, please. Then the king called together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. He went up to the temple of the Lord with the people of Judah, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets, all the people from the least to the greatest. He read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the temple of the Lord. The king stood by the pillar and renewed the covenant in the presence of the Lord to follow the Lord and keep his commands, statutes, and decrees with all his heart and all his soul, thus confirming the words of the covenant written in this book. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. The king ordered Hilkiah. Uh, the high priest, the priest next in rank, and the doorkeepers to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the starry hosts. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron Valley and took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with the idolatrous priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations and to all the starry hosts. He took the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord to the Kidron Valley outside Jerusalem and burned it there. He ground it to powder and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people. He also tore down the quarters of the male shrine prostitutes that were in the temple of the Lord, the quarters where women did weaving for Asherah. And then 25 to 27. Um, neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger, which burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to arouse his anger. So the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my presence as I removed Israel, and I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said, my name shall be there. Okay, this is given a greater context to... Um, Jeremiah's ministry. You'll remember that young King Josiah, who was eight years old when he became king, um, began making reforms early in his life. And at the age of 26, uh, Hilkiah the priest, again, this gives you a, a sense of what Israel was like. The temple of God. What's the temple of God used for? The temple of Yahweh. What, what, what's the temple of Yahweh used for? I'm not trying to make a tricky question. All right, a place of prayer, a place of worship, sacrifice. Um, even in what we just read, it told us some of the things that were going on inside the temple that was dedicated to Yahweh. What were some of the things going on? Prostitution. Prostitution. Shrine prostitution. Part of the religion of these false idols. What else was going on? Sacrifices to other gods. Sacrifices to other gods. And what's one of the things that's kind of interesting because our blessing center has um, has a group of, of ladies who do sewing for for good uh, for good deeds. Uh, what, what, what kind of sewing was going on? It was for Asher. It was it was for this this uh, goddess. They were sewing for her in the temple. Let me pass this over in the temple of Yahweh, okay? So Josiah comes on the scene and he starts making reforms. He starts getting rid of the idols. He grinds them up. He takes them to the Kidron Valley, burns them up. He is uh, leading a tremendous reform. Now, here's another circumstance that should catch our attention. 
Hilkiah the priest in the temple of God apparently was, I don't know exactly what he was doing, maybe as he was cleaning it out at Josiah's request, he comes across the book of the law. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a little bit. It's comparable for us to us coming together as a church here at the church building for 20, 30, 100 years. And a Bible's not found once. They have been engaging in um, religious ritual and tradition all these years without having the book of the law. Hilkiah the priest finds it. Josiah, they come and they bring it to King Josiah and they read it to Josiah. And Josiah says, We're in trouble. Mm -hmm. God's got to be angry with what's going on. Let's start reform. So that's what Josiah did. Led this, what seemed to be this great, great reform. In fact, it said in verses 25 through 27, uh, neither before nor after Josiah, there was a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his strength, and all his soul, and with all his strength in accordance with all the law of Moses. Josiah did everything within his power to turn the people around. But as we're going to find, that was not enough. So here's the question. King Josiah led a revival five years before Jeremiah began his work. But it proved to be superficial and nationalistic rather than a revival from the heart. Why were Josiah's reforms and Jeremiah's preaching not enough to appease God's wrath? He gives us a little glimpse in verses 26 and 27 why it, that didn't appease God's wrath. What does he say? Massive, messed up. Manasseh messed it up. Who's Manasseh? Uh, All right. Manasseh is one of the Jewish kings. I believe he is Josiah's grandfather. Yeah. Okay. He's Josiah's grandfather. And Manasseh, the Bible describes him as someone who was as evil a king as there has ever been in Israel even worse than King Ahab. He engaged in idolatry. He engaged in child sacrifice. Um, he tried to destroy worship of Yahweh. Uh, he put people to death um, who were innocent. And what, what verses 26 and 27 point out is the acts of Manasseh were so bad that God said at some point, Israel is going to have to deal with the consequences. <laughs> now, what is, um, what is interesting is that even Manasseh had a moment of <laughs> clarity and sobriety and penitence in his life. He had been humbled by God and, and turned toward God, but he had left his mark on the hearts of the people. And so God, God is, is, is um, God makes a decision that they're too far gone. Because God is not looking for superficial reform. He's looking for repentance from the heart. And, and despite all of, of Josiah's efforts, despite him trying to purge the, the nation of evil, 
and and reinstitute the covenant. You know, they they started taking the Passover again. They started trying to keep the law again. Uh, he, he tried to to reignite the priesthood again. It still was only superficial because people's hearts had not been changed. Okay. I'm going to pause right here um, and ask you a question that I normally would ask at the end of class. What is that already telling us about God? What are we already, what are we already learning about God based on that? Grace of God. Yeah, it could have been taken care of a long time ago, but he tried to give All right. every opportunity. He's being patient with them. He's giving them an opportunity. He's sending prophets. God is being gracious to them, but it's not working. What else did we learn about God? He gets angry because he's scary. Why is that scary? So powerful. Yeah. And you know what? I, I, I think, at least as an initial response, if God heard you say that, he'd say, thank you. I'm glad that there's a fear of the Lord here. You know? Because fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. Uh, but apparently there wasn't a fear of the Lord. In Israel. What else did you learn about God? You can't fool him. If you if, if we simply go through the motions. He knows that. So he's looking for authentic transformation of heart. And if he doesn't see it, he responds the way that an almighty God who is worthy of all of our praise and adoration would. Okay. So let's turn over to Jeremiah. Things are not looking good in Israel. So God begins to send an army of prophets. Jeremiah chapter 1. Somebody read verses 4 through 6, please. The word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. The last sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. Okay. This is the uh, appointment, if you will, the call of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a preacher's kid. He was the son of Hilkiah the priest. But he was single, sensitive to criticism, as we'll see, and struggled at times with the harshness of God's message. God, and he'll tell God, we'll come to, the, to examples of this, he'll tell God, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't want to, I don't want to tell the people this. This, this, is, this is hard news. Um, because he knew it wouldn't be popular. Um, he didn't seem like a great choice for a prophet. Yet, what was God's purpose for his life and what it enabled him to serve God well? What did God want him to do? <coughs> what, it, what did work verses 4 through 6 tell us that God wanted him to do? Prophet, prophet of the nations. I want you to be a prophet to the nations. What was Je Jeremiah's reaction? I'm too, I'm too young. I don't know exactly how old he was, um, but there's a, a clear sense of, of inadequacy <clears throat> that he feels. I forgot Moses' issue. It was not his apparently. Yeah. And Moses wasn't young when God called him. <laughs> you know, he was 80 years old. So... 
you can imagine how intimidating that would be to be called by God for such a big job and have an idea of what um, the reaction of the people would be. There's something revealing in this passage about God, too. What does it say about God's knowledge of Jeremiah? Our day and age, this is a hard conversation because it's before before you were born in the womb, I knew you. That's not popular. Why is that? Why do you say it's a hard conversation? It's not what people want to hear. Yeah. God knows you in the womb. Which into which intimates there's life. There's life. There, this this is a human being. <laughs> this is not just a collection of. Um, of sales. Okay. I knew you in the womb, Jeremiah. Um, so it's a lesson about the unborn. And so he was chosen even before he, he, he came uh, out of the womb to be a prophet to the nations. His, his writings, because this, this is where he was included as, as a prophet to the nations, his writings, and we're not going to spend a lot of time with them because they're kind of the generally the same message. He had messages for Moab, for Edom, for Philistia, for Israel. He was a prophet to many nations and told them essentially all to repent. Jeremiah, and this is an important, I think, lesson for us. Jeremiah felt inadequate for the job. But here's the lesson for us. But he was willing. Um, any of you all feel inadequate for certain tasks that you feel called to do? God's not, God is not looking to us in our own power to fulfill the call and purpose that he gives to us. He just needs us to be willing. Okay? He just needs us to be willing. I, I don't think I can teach that Bible class. Well, you probably can't, but are you willing? Okay? And, and then God can use you. We're gonna we're gonna come across a phrase from Jeremiah later on where where Jeremiah says, God said, I need somebody. And Jeremiah says, Here am I, send me. I'm willing. Okay. That's what God is looking for for us. He's he's not looking for people who have um, everything figured out and and who are you know, exceptionally skilled. At, he's looking for people who are willing. That's who, he, who he can use. And so make yourself willing. All right. Jeremiah chapter 1, 10 through 16. Somebody read that. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you see, Jeremiah? I see the branch of an almond tree, I replied. The Lord said to me, you have seen correctly, for I am watching to see that my word is fulfilled. Through 16. The word of the Lord came to me again. What do you see? I see a pot that is boiling, I answered. It is tilting toward us from the north. The Lord said to me, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. I'm about to summon all the peoples of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. Their kings will come and set up their thrones in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against all her surrounding walls and against all the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgments on my people because of their wickedness and forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods and in worshiping what their hands have made. Okay, so, so God lays out the plan for Jeremiah. Here's, here's what's about to happen. Uh, nations from the north, uh, this is going to be a specific reference to Babylon, 
they're going to come up and they're going to set up residence right here in, in Jerusalem. And there's a reason for it that God lays out. So here's the question. During Jeremiah's service, Israel often worshipped um, Baal or Baal and Asherah, worshipping idols in the temple dedicated to Yahweh and practiced religious prostitution, ritual drunkenness, child sacrifice, witchcraft, and sorcery. These are God's chosen people. Okay, this, this is not just heathen nation. These, these are God's chosen people. What message did God call Jeremiah to deliver to the people of Israel? What did he tell them was to, to tell the people? Mm -hmm. Get ready, his wrath is coming. Get ready, because wrath is coming. It was a message of condemnation. It was a message of destruction, which then, like now, was not popular at all. What do people prefer to hear? Sunshine and rainbows. Sunshine and rainbows. Okay. <laughs> And star sunbeams from heaven. Yeah. People prefer you to tell them that things are fine. Things are fine. People prefer uh, to be told that they're great people. You guys are great. You're the best. People prefer to hear that they don't need to change. Oh, you're fine just the way you are. In short, people prefer to live in self-deception. Right? Um, what I sense, is, especially when I look at media of any kind, whether it's social media or news media, is that the attitude of people in general especially in America, is don't mess with my life. Don't tell me how to live my life. Don't mess with my life. Okay? Your hands off. Especially leave your hands off my religion and my personal practices. That's none of your business. Do I, do I exaggerate in my assessment? Okay. Um, that's kind of how Israel reacted to Jeremiah. We, we don't want to hear from you, Jeremiah. Don't, don't mess in our business. This is not your business. Everything was fine until you came along. Okay? And, and, and that illustrates again uh the, the the human tendency to kind of turn turn the tables and say my life was great until you came along and started messing messing it up and, and telling us stuff about all the mistakes we were making uh and so they blame the person they blame the messenger instead of looking honestly at their lives. And this was what was going on in Jerusalem. That's why this lesson is called Jeremiah, Prophet for Today. Okay? Well, so what do you think? I'm going to see more of the questions. I will save it then. Yeah. All right, so let's jump to Jeremiah 7, 25 through 27. From the time your ancestors left Egypt until now, day after day, again and again, I sent you my servants, the prophets, but they did not listen to me or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and did more evil than their ancestors. When you tell them all of this, they will not listen to you. 
When you call to them, they will not answer. Would you like to get that from uh, God as part of your job assignment? It goes there when I want you to, but they're not going to listen to you. Yeah, how'd you like that to have mm -hmm. your assignment? I mean, most of us like to feel a sense of success. Uh, Jeremiah is not going to feel any sense of success in the sense of making a difference among the people he's preaching to. So here's the question. God called Jeremiah to use creative means of communicating his message. For instance, Jeremiah took a linen girdle, buried it, and dug it up again to illustrate decay. He put a yoke around his neck to illustrate slavery. He bought property when it appeared worthless to illustrate hope. Some people found Jeremiah quite entertaining. What was the ultimate outcome of his efforts? God told him this is what's going to be the outcome. What was the outcome? They're not going to change. They're not going to listen. It's the same message he gave to the prophet Ezekiel at the same time. He told Ezekiel, I'm sending you to a stubborn, stiff-necked people. Here's what I want you to say to them, but I'm going to tell you they will totally disregard what you have to say, but you go anyway. How would you like that, son? It would be hard to have enthusiasm for that. <laughs> yeah, it would. Why? Why is it? Why would it be? If you go in knowing that it's not going to turn out well, it would be hard to. Yeah. And he had to, he had to had fear as well because mm -hmm. you know they didn't like what he was saying. They just shoot the messenger literally. Mm -hmm. So nobody listened. Instead, they looked for ways to shut Jeremiah up. And and, and here's interesting thing that happens later in his ministry. Uh, People come to him in desperation. They finally come to their senses as, as Jerusalem is being destroyed. And they say, Jeremiah, tell us what to do. Whatever you say, we'll, we'll do it. And, and he says to them, no, you won't. I said, yes, we promise. So he told them what to do. And he said, stay here and turn yourself over to the Babylonians. And the people responded by saying, God didn't tell you to tell us that. And so they didn't do what Jeremiah said anyway. That's what he dealt with his whole life. Even when people promised, even when people swore, I'm going to do what you say to do, so tell us what to do. They still wouldn't do it. Okay? That's what Jeremiah's life was like. But what did God want Jeremiah to do? Go to, Go to them anyway. Lesson. What's the lesson in there for us? Go. Go. Be obedient. We get too concerned, I think, at times with the outcome and feeling success. Well, if, it, if it's not going to amount to anything, then I don't want to do it. Why would I want to do it? Why would I, why would I waste my energy? Okay, so here's the question. Is it a waste of energy to be faithful to God and obedient to him? Even if nobody responds? I'm going to give you a little insight to a preacher I know. Um that sometimes wonders if I if I get up and I say what you want me to say, 
will it make any difference? And if it's not going to make any difference, why do why should I keep doing it? You're not in control of the outcome of other people. You're only in the control of your own heart for God. And that's the faith lesson, Amy. You're exactly right. That's the faith lesson for all of us. Not just for the preachers and prophets. It's the faith lesson for all of us. It's not a matter of, do, will people do what I want them to do if I obey you, God? It's, will I do what God wants me to do that he's calling me to do? Not what he's calling somebody else to do, but what he's calling me to do. And what I love about Jeremiah is that's the way he lived. Even when he hated it. And we're going to see times that he hated it. We're going to see times when Jeremiah will say, I wish I hadn't been born. That's pretty bad, isn't it? I feel like this can be applied to the parental realm, the, the doctor realm, any of it. It's just all... Yeah. That's how I feel when I'm talking to my kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just like, oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. You, you, that's a great point. Uh, in fact, one of the things since you brought, went in that direction for a minute, one of the things I tell young parents is this. You are not going to get affirmation for the job you're doing for, the, for 20 years. Do the right thing anyway. That's what makes parenting so hard. You know, if your children came home every day and said, oh, I've come to realize how wonderful I am, how wonderfully privileged I am to have you as my parent and how wise you are in, in disciplining me and, and teaching me responsibility, how wonderful you are as a parent. That would be pretty good parenting gig, right? That's not happening. It's not happening. What? Unless they want something. <laughs> Which makes it even worse. Okay? They're just using me. So parenting is, is, a, is an act of faith. I have to do the right things even when I don't get affirmation, even when I don't get the results I'm looking for. I'm doing this out of my obedient faith to God. Okay. And I know there's still some young parents in here, and so I hope that that's encouraging to you. Um, that's what I would always tell myself. That's the self-talk I always had. <sighs> have to deal with this again. Keep doing the right thing, Dale. And I'm going to tell you, it, 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 my son Jared, um, the redhead in our family, the redheads. <laughs> um, wow. There were times I wanted, I, I just, I wanted to quit with him because he just never seemed to get it. <laughs> you know who I have the closest relationship with now among my adult children? Jared. And Laura used to say he's the most like me, which may have been part of the problem that I had with you know, dealing with it. And so it's important in carrying out the call that God gives to you to do it faithfully, to do it obediently, and don't measure what you do by whether you get the results you want. Measure it by whether you're being faithful to what God has called you to. Okay. I think the dif a difference though is that as we're going about our lives, we still have hope that what we're doing is going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Like he didn't have any. <laughs> I just mm -mm. can't get past that. That would be. So, so what did he? That's a great point. So, what did he have to look forward to? 
mean, if he believed what God told him that this was basically pointless as far as saving these people, I don't know. Like his, come on, his own salvation. His own salvation. God's approval. God's approval. Doing what God. And I think too, this is also this. It's whole holistically, he's not going to have success. He's not going to have. I was thinking about Jonah because you know Jonah runs away from it. He goes, I know that you're, you know, slow to slow to anger. You're compassionate, and and you will save these people. Whereas Jeremiah is getting the uh, the opposite message. But I think it doesn't mean that there's nobody that was saved in Jerusalem. There's nobody that was that was repentance. It's holistically as a as a group, they're not listening. They're going to be taken over. That doesn't mean there's not a remnant. And you're preaching to them to the remnant. You know, you're you're still you still have a message. You still have a valuable message. But holistically, you're not going to win the war. You may win a battle, but you're not going to win the war. Yeah. In this one. And so the reward is is one one's own salvation, being faithful to God's task. I mean, that's a reward in itself, just simply being faithful. And that he is pleased and re will reward me for being faithful to him. Um, Jesus lived his life always trying to please Father. It was never about numbers. It was never about outcome. It was always about, have I pleased you, Father? And that is the way Jeremiah lived, okay? So I, I think that's a great lesson for us. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in, in his name, the word is like, his word is in my heart like fire. The fire is shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. In your own words, what's Jeremiah saying? to say it but um I, I can't hold it in I have to speak it I have to do it even when I don't want to it just keeps gnawing at me burning in me I have to say it Jeremiah dealt with loneliness rejection and feeling unappreciated yet he couldn't keep silent what do we learn from Jeremiah's life about special assignments from God When I hear people, and here's where I'm, this is coming from, when I hear people talk about God is calling me to something, you know, you know what it usually is? It's usually some grand, very rewarding, uh, positive, uh, I'm going to reach millions of people, and it's very grandiose. What do we learn from Jeremiah's example? about the call of God. It's not always fun. <laughs> it's not always fun. But you're going to suffer, but you're doing it for me. You're going to suffer, but you're doing it for me. Chess? I mean, verse 7, verse 8, he's saying, I was ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. I'm proclaiming violence and destruction. I'm insulted all the time. And yet, if I don't talk about it, I can't not keep it in. Like he's he's stuck. If I talk, I'm gonna get ridiculed. I'm gonna get I'm gonna get reproached. I'm gonna get all the bad things. But if I don't talk, it's almost worse. Yeah, yeah. And that's and that's where he was, and and he learned to deal with that. So I like your word stuck. He was stuck. And it's it's, it's not like that. He he he. It finally just built and built and built to where, you know, he was worried of holding it in. He had to continue to speak what the Lord told him to. So even through all this suffering and ridicule and whatever, he just kept it and built a fire to where he couldn't contain it. And so again, here's, here's the lesson. There's a lesson in that for us. 
when God calls you, it doesn't mean that there's it's going to be glory and glamour. That's not what it necessarily means. Oftentimes, God calls us to things that are thankless, dangerous, and unpopular. And what we have to remember is, be faithful anyway. Be faithful anyway. Okay? Question seven. Now that you know more about Jeremiah, the nature of his prophetic work, and the environment in which he prophesied, what stands out to you about him and why, and how do you think Jeremiah would fare if he was a prophet in the United States today? So what stands out to you about Jeremiah, first of all? So I think that last verse that we read shows that he, he had a lot of passion for this. Conviction. He couldn't even keep it inside. He was so passionate about the message. So his passion stands out to you. Okay. Someone else, what stands out to you? Mark? Perseverance, resilience. Yeah. His perseverance, his resilience, his, his ability to bounce back is remarkable. What else? Well, his desire to please God over his disappointments and that was foremost in his life. That's what he lived for, which is, by the way, why Jeremiah is my favorite prophet. Because he encourages me as a preacher. Every time I read Jeremiah, I am encouraged. And that may seem strange, but what I'm encouraged by is Jeremiah's commitment to do what God called him to do. <clears throat> even when it was hard. That encourages me. All right. How do you think Jeremiah uh, would fare if he was uh, a prophet in the United States today? Someone would want to kill him. Do I? Someone would want to kill him. Why? Because it's an unpopular mission. Same kind of circumstance. Good. Yeah. I think he would be treated similarly to how he was treated then. I think there would be people who would see him as a novelty. I mean, how many of you have ever been into a, a big city? I, I've seen this in the city of uh, San Francisco, particularly. Uh, the side, the sidewalk uh, preachers. Have you all seen, you've seen sidewalk? Yeah. 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 I, think, I think Jeremiah would be considered novelty by people. Uh, he, he's kind of entertaining, kind of a weird guy, but he's entertaining. I think a lot of people would see him as a pain in the behind. I think a lot of people would see him as irrelevant. He's talking about God and moral morality, and and, he, and they would you know persecute him for waiting for him to slip up. And... Yeah. And so here's, here's the deal. Unfortunately, message of, messages of condemnation don't usually play well, especially when you don't know God and expect only positive messaging. We live in a culture right now, and I'm talking about the religious culture. I'm not talking about the culture at large. We live in a religious culture right now that expects only positive messaging. And so um, messages about repentance don't play well. And that's why Jeremiah would probably get a similar reception today that he got then. So this is the beginning of our journey with Jeremiah. I hope you've gained an appreciation for him and understand a little bit more about the heart of God through the uh, ministry of Jeremiah. Have a blessed week.